right. Welcome all to this session. Uh, it's all about spatial Drupal. I'm Floris van Geel, and I call myself a Drupal entrepreneur, which means that I work about 60% for my clients to keep my chimney smoking and to pay for my people, and 40% is developing own products and own ideas. My company is called Zero Forty Lab, and you can find me with at Zero Forty Lab on the Twitter and on IRC. I still do IRC and do support there. I'm Zelf here. So first, let's do a show of hands. Who is here to learn something about mapping? Yes, great, great, great. Who knows <coughs> other kinds of context for content that is not necessarily text images? Yeah. Who's here for the Drupal superhero stickers? Oh, yeah, yeah, but I expected like half the, we say, oh, no, we're here for just for the stickers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Please sit down, come on in. I just explained something about me. You didn't miss anything important yet. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about how to use Drupal in a content context that is not text images or videos. It will handle about, yes, please come in, no problem. Come in, come in. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Mapping, like GIS, Geographical Information Systems, Urbania, city planning, building engineering, like so facilitation of the building within your website, which is really awesome. And then as a grand south over all of it, we will have the internet of everything. And I brought some sensors you can look at. I will talk about those. And with the cheap hardware, we can make the internet of sensors and things accessible today. So let me first start with mapping. In the old days, the world was flat. And we would believe that if we sailed to the end of the world, we would fall off. And then, at a certain point in time, 1569, Mr. Mercator, he made a projection. And the projection? divided the world on the equator and through uh, during which mean time with zeros. And from there on, we could map out all the quadrants of the world, conquer it, and find our route safely back home. Then a lot of time passed, and Google came along in 2005. And they had two revolutionary ideas. First, they made the world flat again in order to fit in a 265 tile. And then once you zoom in, you have the web mercator, and you see that Greenland is way too high, and that things don't really fit that well on a far zoomed out level. But if you get closer on the map, you will have perfect squares of 265 tiles with the actual buildings, roads, and infrastructure. So thanks to Google, we have this great mappy thing, and we can <laughs> do it in Drupal. Then, skip a bit further away. 2014, I got a phone call, and somebody said, yeah, we are building this mapping GIS system. I said, oh, that's great. I've already done Google Maps and find my nearest beer store applications, so why not? I can look up for the challenge. And what I found there was a very nice IS server with Windows, and it did some kind of a mapping, but it wasn't actually a product. So what we did, yes, please come in, take a seat, don't be shy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you didn't even come for the stickers. No. Ah. <laughs> but I think uh, one of the attendants brought it to the help desk. So, Thank you. But Sorry. Feel, feel free to sit down and enjoy. <laughs> no problem, no problem. So after this phone call, we've been working for two years now, and now we have the, the second minimal viable product, where you have a map of the Netherlands, and this is for digging trenches for glass fiber connections up to the home and to the office. So if you click on a little flag, you get a pop-up balloon, and then you go to the next phase where the actual value has been presented. You have a connection here, and it has a location, and the total work in relation to what is planned is measured by the day. And the contractors and the sub-subcontractors, they, with this, they can meet their challenges and finish their workloads on time. If you zoom in for a certain map area, then we have the gutters, the trenches, and the holes where the whole fiber optic cable system comes together. 
This thing is being built using an open source uh, Drupal distribution, which is called Kartaro, and it has the best of the Drupal 7 integration of modules. So the CAD drawing, which is made with AutoCAD, has been is eaten by feeds. The feeds will through it through a, a geocoder, geofield. It's then stored in a post GIS database. The GeoServer will pick that up and make it into a nice WFS, which is an open standard for vectors on the map. And then we can get the layer back, style it with behaviors on the map, and present it to the end user within a Drupal. That's great. Another great thing that we have in, in Holland is that with my tax money, we have humongous sets of open data. And this open data is accessible to everyone, not only the government, but also to companies and uh, civilians, anyone who is willing to use this data can use it for free. So we used a lot of those in the systems as well, and I see far more opportunity with these open data sets. So if we look at this product, how can we improve it for future usage? We all know that Drupal isn't that well in handling files and handling revisions. So on the file side, there is a lot of improvement possible, especially with versioning either with using file entity or integrating uh, a file a document management system like Alfresco. And the next challenge is to get that one working. Uh, we already implemented the organic group's LDAP connection. So we have a central authentication service with Drupal and it talks to the, the client and then we know who belongs to what stack and what project. Uh, the geo components can become a lot leaner and I myself want to have real-time presentation on the map of the progress that's been made in this project. And of course, you can always add more caching, more performance. Please come in, take a seat. So, the next thing is how can we use this in Drupal 8? Not now, but tomorrow. The good thing is that uh, Paul built the new OpenLayers 3 on top of the service container framework, which means that it has a symphony base, uh, component injection, and those kind of things. So it wouldn't be that hard a challenge to migrate that to Drupal 8. The service design core, with these kinds of systems, we notice that if we have many Drupal sites that work together, they are much stronger than <laughs> one monolithic site that does everything. No problem, come in, have a seat. And another great challenge for uh, having Drupal 8 mapping is MapBender. And MapBender is an open source project that is being built on Symfony and has been targeted at mapping. So that's a very interesting one. Later on I might push the demo to show it to you, but I have another one which might be interesting, more interesting. The next chapter will be about Urbania city planning. This is what we did for our local municipality of Eindhoven, the town where I come from. You have all the plans that are made by the government, by the municipalities, together as an open data source on the map. And what we did, we took these data sources and made a nice CMS around for them so they could buy their own data back and have an insight on, for example, if you live here and you click on the map, you get a pop-up. You're not allowed to extend your house more than this amount of meters. In the Netherlands, there's really strict building compliance rules. That's why all houses look the same and so nice. <laughs> Envisioning that, I was really fascinated with SimCity, especially the latest version, because our uh, collector for statistical uh, data, the CBS, they have 100 meters square tiles with an index of how the poverty is going on, how the housing is going on, how the social state, the welfare, etc. are going on. So I foresee that these data layers can be intertwined within the 100 meter square. You can just make a nice column and you can show, okay, these, this data has a relation, this data makes a meaning, and in that case, build the next, next, next generation web components and web systems. And there's already two nice frameworks available. And they both happen in the front end. These days, computers got much more graphical power than they used to have. So we can just render the 3D buildings in the front end. Uh, one of the main components is 
OSM buildings and OpenStreetMap has already the storage for the height of the building as well as the shape of the roof. So if you have uh, some kind of data there, please give it back to the guys from OpenStreetMap and girls because that way we can have an enriched environment. For example, if you go to Paris uh, with, by Google Map Travels or TomTom Tom, and you go to Disneyland, on OpenStreetMap, every fun fair is indexed and mapped within OpenStreetMap because people could. Another great one is uh, from UK origins and that takes OpenStreetMap contour and extrudes it. So that's a, a front-end JavaScript framework with whom you can easily project and make city scenes, cityscapes. Now we go to this third part of my presentation. It's about building information management systems. The eye is the most important one. These days, all buildings, well, all buildings that are bigger and built under architecture, they do have a building information model, which means you have all the geometry that, is, that you see around you, including all the metadata. For example, what kind of a doorknob is that one? And what kind of uh, plan goes with the key? And this information usually ends up at the architect on the Z drive, where they store the data. And in my opinion, it belongs to the owner of the building. So I just explained what a BIM is. It's a digital representation of the building uh, where <coughs> the, there's information is the most important about the thing and you can point at the thing. So some people say it's all about processes. Some people say it's all about philosophy. There's even people uh, staggering that it's about a level of detail, like how detailed you model this little device. That's not the case. It's all about data. Because the smartest people say it's about data. But this whole building information model, it's not completely about software. So how does this process fulfill itself? It's about the same as that we did in software development before we had Scrum. You had the client that had an idea, threw it over the shed, and then the architect cut it and made a nice drawing plan, threw it over the shed again, and then the contractor thought, oh, that will be expensive, and made a construction drawing. Then the work preparator would make another plan on how to facilitate the work, and then finally the guy who's supposed to do the work could do the work. If you compare a traditional uh, 2D CAD drawing building process uh, with a B BIM, BIM workflow, then you see that you are, just like Agile, more able to adapt to changing circumstances and you're more able to do changes and improvements without increasing the budget. There were some real smart guys uh, and girls who together made an open standard for the building information models, which has been defined by the IFC, Industry Foundation class. And that way you just have a huge text file that contains all the information about the, 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 the building, so the, the geometry as well <coughs> as the information model. And uh, we use that with open source technology made by TNO in the Netherlands, which is called the BIM server. And the BIM server will eat the drawings and with the Drupal we ask it for the meta information. And then we use one entity for one or more items in the building. And that way, if we link those up, we can do multi-year maintenance planning, calculations, room booking and all kinds of other cool stuff. And the great thing about an open data text format is that you're not reliant on the CAD software. So you can read it in 20 years because it's just text. And you're able to be up to date about all your objects in the building. Then also, just like software, but it goes a bit quicker, a building has a life cycle. Uh, we have a great idea, we design it and plan it, then it's been built and delivered. That's a big hassle between contractors who hit each other around the, the, <coughs> the, the ears with contracts. And then we get the most interesting part of the building the 30 years or more that's been operated and maintained. So as an entrepreneur, I believe that the first phase is to 
construct products for is this operational phase. And if you do that well, and if you know the deterioration and how much is changed in the building, you also know its end uh, components. So you can recycle them or reuse them in other buildings. And that helps us around with the environment very much. So this whole process is all about democratizing this building information system and also democratizing the open government data sets in order to provide the people with insights. You don't need specific computer experience. You just need to be able to operate a CMS. And in the end, it will be applicable throughout the whole life cycle. Although I believe that there need to be yeah, there need to be two models. Here, when the design is done, you have a freeze model. And then just before you start operating, you check if what is built is actually still consistent with the model. But that's a slight detail. Oh. So with that, we have a new definition of the BMS. The BMS is being used for facility management only, and these are monologous systems with a lot of fill-in forms, just like SAP. Maybe somebody heard about SAP. It's a lot of fun for the end user. They will not keep that much hair at the end. So in Holland, we have a, a rule, which is, which is defined by the NAN. It's like ISO. And with that, we have a determination of the total li life cycle of a building component. And then after half time, so it's an inverse atomic bomb, uh, it degrades from excellent to good, and so on, and so on, and so on. So with that, you can ask the contractor, OK, what is important in your building? Uh, do you have uh, beliefs in aesthetics? Some do for the entrance. But most of them just say, OK, we want safety and health uh, satisfied, and we have some usability in business. And with those, it's just linear calculation. And you can do linear calculation pretty well in the Drupal. So with that, we're going to shape multi-year multi maintenance planning. And then we get to the Drupal superpower. Because we have a link from one entity to one or more components in the building, we can add issue queues. We can add documentation. We can add calculations. We can add workflows, references, and all the regular Drupal site building modules that we can all download from Drupal.org. So technically, we have this uh, BIM server that eats the BIM model. And so far, it's one monolithic application. So I'm going to scratch the whole uh, process on how this is built. However, the components, the individual components, will still be there, since the next step is to enrich it with sensors and to have actors visible in the building. For example, this room, you can't book it as a, uh, um, as a room at this point because I'm giving a presentation. So you can see it on the outside of the door. And in the end, we want a happy user who can operate this building through the internet. Yes. Oh, shit. Um, so first development will be this five-year maintenance planning I explained about. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, there's still a big challenge in IT on covering and capturing expert logic in our systems, and that's still an open thing, maybe something for above. I tried it in Munich, but didn't come that much ideas out of it. But maybe we try it again. And another thing is to have a Kickstarter <coughs> in the building field. And now currently the 3D visualization is built in CNJS. And 3JS just has a lot more, oops, a lot more potential in having textures and having interactive components. Uh, like I said before, add real-time sensors so you'll actually get data from the environment and visualize it inside the buildings as well as inside the environment. And all the building blocks that we make in order to use uh, the buildings uh, as well as the city planning will be provided on Drupal.org for under GPL2. Now we get to the source that covers it all, the Internet of Everything. So if we predict like 2020, we have half of the world population. By that time, we have over 8 billion people. They are connected to the internet. It will be a market of 
4 trillion US and there will be more than 25 million apps around. Imagine that you have to download a few. Every person will have five screens at his disposal and we will all blow like 50 trillion gigabytes of data per day. Just like nothing. <coughs> we already have good infrastructure and it will be, grown, be, be, be growing for years on Moore's law. So what can we do today? There is three interesting devices. Uh, maybe a lot of you have seen the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi, which are microcomputers um, who go slightly up in, please come in, take a seat, in cost, but they also grow in power. And these days for 45 euros, a Raspberry Pi 3 will give you four cores and one gigabyte of RAM. So it's a great thing to start prototyping with now. And another thing I bought is the Parallela. And the Parallela is when you need a little bit more computing power. It has 16 cores on board. And you can also use that with open source in order to have a local microcluster. Then on top of that, there is all kinds of different sensors. And I just picked one for show and tell. Uh, that is a motion sensor. So if I, it's over there on the, on the table. So if you hang it in this room, you can see which is actually used and use that, for example, in a cleaning program. So the cleaning lady can just look at the map and say, oh, these parts are, no, are not used that much. And this one is really, really dirty, so I start there. And another great thing I bought is a 4, 3D, 433 megahertz receiver. And the cool thing is that it works with IKEA stuff and Philips stuff and click on, click out, which is a uh, home automation that you can just buy around in shops in the, in, in the construction market for 30 euros. And with these devices, I want to couple all this data back and start with uh, my building, of course, and from there on, keep on building. Another one, which is a great Kickstarter that just been launched uh, from the high-tech campus in Eindhoven, is the Wi-Pi. It consists of minimal Python, and it has Wi-Fi, as well as the new LoRa. LoRa is a low-power, long-range, machine-to-machine radio channel. So every Wednesday, I don't do software, I do my hardware experiments. So these new gadgets will keep me going uh, for the next two, three months. All in all, how do these things have to communicate with each other? Uh, we all know, oh, oh, sorry. We all know this, it, no, sorry, <laughs> I just don't beam. Go back. Ah, we all know HTTP, uh, Wi-Fi, UDP, and I want to zoom in into one specific protocol. Top left, MQTT. MQTT is a very ancient protocol, if you talk about protocols. It's well over 10 years old and uh, defined by IBM, Philips, Facebook, they all got together and they thought, okay, if machines have to talk with each other, uh, we have to have some kind of a protocol that is more efficient than the default HTTP that we have. So it's optimized for low bandwidth. If we compare HTTP with MQTT, then we see that it only consists of like two bytes to send a message and it is a set and forget protocol. So if I'm a device and I have some information, I just throw it around. And then another device will, will get that and say, well, it's not for me, but I will just keep on transmitting until it's finally uh, at the receiving point. And you only need 80 kilobytes for a full back and forth broker connection. A packet would look like this, and this packet would say, hello world, just about there. And then for interpreting, um, the last time I gave the presentation, there weren't that many implementations. And now we already see a nice Drupal 8 sandbox on Drupal.org that implements MQTT. And there's a good PHP layer library for it. And there's also a, oops, a, a Rabbit MQ, and that is an open source um, tool. Uh, to exchange this kind of a data. Uh, there's 
loads of Java middleware, uh, of whom two are open source and the others are not. I had a slide before, but I don't deep dive in that one anymore. And you can also make a custom Node.js data runner uh, that makes sense out of all this sensor data and acts upon your web solution. Then we get to the semantic web. We all heard about the semantic web and there, all around there is many talks about how to R use RDF, schema.org. If you don't know anything about it, Google it on YouTube. There's great presentations about schema.org and uh, graphing tools and so on. Uh, I want to point out one new kit on the blog. And um, tomorrow at uh, 10.45 in the auditorium, Fubi will give a presentation with two other good guys uh, about GraphQL in combination with React.js. And the cool thing about GraphQL is that you just ask it, give me your schema. And it will provide you with all its possibilities. And with that, you can interactively query the uh, REST endpoint. So that's uh, one thing to put in your agenda for tomorrow. In summary, we've seen that we have uh, some city engineer. Oh, Jesus. Here we go again. Oh, oh, oh. I got it for my birthday in August. So. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we have some, some city planning with some uh, open data on top of that from the government. And then we can place sensors in the buildings as well as in the environments. Combining those, we can give next level of web systems insight in what is actually happening and how we can improve our own world and each other's world. So this is about the talk. Um, this slide is for Friday. I hope you all join the contributor sprints. Uh, there's 15 minutes left. Um, I can show a little demo because there's, yeah. About how this building management thingy is, is working, system. That you have, for example, if I click on a window, then I can ask it for its properties. This is all the, the metadata that the architect put in when he loaded this window into this building. And it also has a, a, a tree where you can put off and on all the objects. It has its own uh, query language, a bit like BIMQL. And we did some tests and investigation on that of that. But it's not that universally scripted, and it's in fact quite hard to write proper BIMQL. So I see a lot of opportunity with GraphQL, especially when we are able to add buttons to query sets. So the end client can just click the button and get the result. He doesn't know, have to know how to query this thing, he just get things done. Is there any questions for now? Oh yeah, um, so in the presentation there, everything is clickable. Uh, this is a thank you note at the end. So for example, this one leads to the link Fizzy Cities. And in the start, I didn't have a good image for the world that was flat. So I just created one in 3JS. So if you open this one. Yeah, but then you have the 3JS object that I used to construct uh, the image. So, thank you very much for your attention. And if there's any questions afterwards, feel free to. Oh, you have a question. Great. Can you please walk up to the mic so it's in the recording?
not really a technical related question. It's more towards the democracy of information that you mentioned. Yeah. What, do you have any sort of pointers for approaching you know, the architects or the powers that be to release that sort of information, uh, the metadata about the buildings, especially in developing countries like where I'm from in South Africa? If you have any sort of pointers of just how to table the conversation without stepping on any toes. Because mm -hmm. I have dealt with architects and, pro and projects previously and uh, we have had those sort of issues with them to hand over blueprints and that sort of thing. It's quite a sensitive topic, I think. Yes, that's true. However, with municipality data and improving neighborhoods, if you, for example, look at the availability of clean water in relation to public health, getting clean water in a place helps boost the population. In Holland, they did a study with broadband internet. They had a neighborhood, half of it had broadband internet with glass fiber, the other one didn't. And they looked at the effects in schools. It was amazing what a little bit of internet did for the education of the children. Mm. And with the, the problem with the architects is that they just sit on their drawings because they think it is their own intellectual property. However, it is the client or the set of owners of the building who actually paid for the bu building to be built. So they own the intellectual property on the drawings. Yeah. So you have to go through the owner <laughs> or through the municipality okay. and then get to the architect. Welcome. Any other questions? <laughs> yes? Hi, I'm interested in how y can you suggest translating a CAD uh, drawing into Drupal entities? That's coming like how, for, for instance, if you want to make a website for architects agency mm -hmm. where they can actually just uh, import their CAD uh, data and then you can view it uh, with uh, 3GS in the browser. Um, you're talking about CAD, that means DWG, AutoCAD drawings. Yeah. Uh, most of them are actually 2D, flat, like the old world. Oh. And a lot of them started to develop in 3D. However, then it would be smarter to have the buildings made with something like Revit or Archicad, uh, because those programs are able to add the metadata as well. Oh. If you would just want to visualize a 3D DWG, and you le look for uh, 3JS and its libraries, there are already libraries who can visualize that without that good of a texture, but you are allowed, you're able to rotate 3D around them and maybe add some interactivity. Uh, we did it in the end of the 90s with uh, VWRML, VRML, which was an export of a 3D geometry with links and the 3D web and those kind of things, yeah. but yeah. In the end, um, open standards as the endpoint for the data is much better than use a proprietary DVG format. And um, what we did is have a, a middleware component, in this case the BIM server, convert the objects that the architects make into open standard. It can even export uh, geo JSON or other kinds of city GML, open standard, open formats. And that empowered us to just work with the data. Because if you want to read a proprietary format, you have to buy yourself into a license system in order to get the latest component to read it and then implement that. It's too much money, too much fuss. Uh, the last question is, yes. have, you, have you implemented uh, real-time data from the IoT sensors? for Drupal? Um, did no. You, did you have any project? Uh, what I did is uh, on my Wednesday uh, hardware hack, I hooked up the, uh, the, the radio sensor uh, to a Linux box and then just read out uh, weather computer and did the, the switch, turn the line on and off. Uh, okay. And then underneath it's translatable as JSON arrays and with that we're going to play a little bit more and start automating stuff. Another question. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the session. You just more or less describe uh, what I've been just digging into in the past two, three months. So my company is working in a project in Gothenburg in Sweden. And what they are doing is uh, building a, a house. Mm -hmm. so 
of apartments with the Chalmers University, and they are filling it with sensors and more or less is describing what you want to approach from the perspective of the building, integrating with sensors, and also integrating with applications. So right now it's a pilot between NASA and a few companies. And the people that is living in the apartment, is uh, they come from the Chalmers University. They're students, and the, the idea is to develop applications as well to interact with the house. So I guess we should talk a little bit later. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, for, for uh, did they look into some kind of middleware to make sense out of sensor data? Yeah. Something like Apache Spark or? Um, no, right now uh, they're just they just put the sensors there. Yeah. They are just receiving data. The, yeah, the yeah, idea yeah, is yeah. they don't know how to continue. Yeah. Yeah, the, the first logical step would be to hook them up to an MQTT message broker. Yeah. So you have your data set, and you will see that it will generate uh, heaps <coughs> and heaps in, of data. Hmm. So then you have to decide in relation to privacy rules, hmm. what are we going to track, and how long are we going to track that? Yeah. What are the essences that we want to filter out of this data? And that can be consumed by your website and by, by your apps, and et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, we were thinking about this uh, mm -hmm. map reduction and you know, and having analytics. But the idea is right now they want to, to get the data and later on just study the energy consumption yeah. during the day or the night or yeah. this kind of yeah, thing. And see, see what we would do with it, yeah. yeah. So we have one equivalent project with a library and they put solar panels on the roof and they deliver solar energy to the neighboring municipality office and school. And then we also want to show the community how much is the balance of what we collectively invested in this building and how green can they be. Yep. Cool. And anyway, anyway, congratulations. Your session is super inspiring. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Um, <coughs> Quick question, right at the start you had uh, a, a map embedded in the Drupal website and when you showed the architecture of it, it was um, post-GIS, GeoServer. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering if uh, that means you're actually storing the, um, uh, the the GIS data itself, the spatial data outside of um, outside of Drupal completely and then and therefore how are you linking it to presumably you're using like some kind of entity in Drupal for the metadata and how, how are you making the link between the two? Yeah, uh, what we used was uh, the GeoServer building blocks specifically, uh, the, Drup the Drupal GeoServer module and uh, we use feeds and then put all the meta in uh, entity collections uh, because at that time there weren't good alternatives, they are now and then the geodata is being sent by this module uh, to the geo server, and that will generate the maps. And they're then, because we already have the data, a little bit of patching, and then also the metadata is in the geo server. So we just have the metadata twice. Right. Okay. So uh, we can use it directly in views as well as use it while clicking on the map. With the feature pop-up. So that possibly answers my next part. I was going to say, why use WFS when you could just use WMS and get the data straight out of uh, Drupal? Because then you then you then you only potentially need to have the. That's a performance thing uh, because the the Java Geo server we can cluster, uh, as well as WMS is tiles, so it's all image. Mm -hmm. So every text, all the meta has to be printed on the map, and that's not desired by the client. They want to click on a line or hover over a line see a little pop-up, or see it changing color, have another component in the website change, etc. So what do you use to render the map then? Open layers. Open layers? Yes. Right. Okay. Cool. Cool. Any other questions? No? I'm here for the rest of the week, and maybe if people are interested in capturing expert logic, we could find a buff slot. If not, we do it at Iron Camp. Um, now we get to the most interesting part of this story. Um, for promo of this talk, I made uh, sheets for whiteboard magnets. And they're designed by, by Ruben, who is also in the room. And for everybody, there is a sheet, but there is still one set of magnets left. <laughs> and the trick question is, how many superheroes are in the presentation? 
So if anybody knows, please raise your hand. The first person to raise the hand may do a guess. Wrong. 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 No. How much? Ten? No. Yes. Here you go. Because one of the 14 was my logo, and that's not a superhero yet. But it's still practicing to be one. So for all of you, there is one of these sheets. There's 500 of those. Once this room is done, I go down to the sprint room and give them a sheet because they're always sprinting and miss out, out of, on the cool stuff. And afterwards, you can find the rest at the Druid stand. Because, yeah, they like cool stuff. Thank you.